Can we bow to the 37th Psalm, Psalm 37? We began this psalm last week, and I prefaced the with going into this psalm with the question, is there is there an image? Is there something that a Christian should look like? Is there a, is there a certain way that they should look um, in terms of their lifestyle, their attitude, whatever? And we we looked at the concept of though we don't earn salvation, though we don't. It is strictly a gift from God. We also don't deny that there is a certain way that someone who is saved will look, or, or the, the, the optimal of that. And, and we, we pointed that out by, once, like I usually do, going to the extreme and then coming backwards. So in other words, is there a certain way that people in heaven will look? Yes. That in heaven there will be a uniformity in righteousness, in love, in peace, in joy, in all of those fruits of the Spirit. When we are in heaven, even though we will still have our personalities and it will be a physical place and all that, we will, we will also, though, have an amazing similarity in, in how we are, how our responses are. In other words, you will never go to your neighbor's house and wonder if they're going to get mad that you knock on their door, right? I wonder if it's too early. Maybe they'll get upset at me. Maybe they'll be irritated. There will never be that because there will only be happiness, joy, peace. There will never be irritation. That's part of this world, right? That's part of the, the yellow of this world, right? We have the blue. Remember the yellow and the blue make green. There's overlap. And so heaven is overlapping with earth right now. In heaven, there is perfection starting with Jesus and working out from those who are in him in heaven. We know that they have a certain likeness, a certain image. And so, as a Christian on earth then, we can say, is there a perfect image of a Christian? There is in Christ. But, but in us, we, won't, we know that we won't hit it, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't exist. In other words, just, just, I, th I think that there is um, such a thing in the world as a billion dollars. It's pretty well established, right? I'll never have it. <laughs> I mean, right, so, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. There is such a thing as a billionaire. Just because I'll never attain that doesn't mean that there isn't an image of that, that there isn't that, right? And just because we will never attain perfection in this life doesn't mean that there isn't perfection, right? And so what would that look like? That's what we've been looking at. And in the 37th Psalm, I said, I think this is just the picture that is portrayed here of a person that is at peace with the world, with himself, with God, he is not fretful. Fret, your, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. I mean, we see that there is this picture of a person that is at peace. He's at rest. Even though the world around him is at war. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way. Refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Those are all commands. Those are all, those are all attitudes. And so often I see such fretful Christians fretting over their own righteousness, fretting over the righteousness of others, fretting over their circumstances, fretting over whether God's happy with them or not fretting over whether they're doing enough. I mean, just all sorts of it. When over and over again, he, he found eight different ways of saying, just relax. The world's a mess, relax. 
That doesn't, if you want to be the antithesis of this world, if you want to shine like light in darkness, relax. Because nobody in the world's doing that. <laughs> nobody in the world's relaxing. In fact, when the Peter discusses or, or says, be ready to give a reason for the hope you have within you, what would be the signifier of the hope you have within you? What, how would somebody know that you have it? it? Because you're at peace when everyone else is at war. You're at peace. How, you ever seen that before? You ever heard that before? Like you'll be watching a movie or something and somebody says, how can you be so relaxed at a time like this? And, you know, usually it's because their superior training and whatnot has just made them so relaxed and something cool and loop. But that should be the Christian in life, in all of life. That should be the Christian. <clears throat> I, I saw a video um, that I thought was pretty amazing um, uh, yesterday. And it was um, my niece that put this video on um, about her arm, her hand and arm. And I thought it was interesting because, you know, she's having trouble with her arm, whatever. And eventually she said, you know, I just, I was just finally overwhelmed. It just, you know, kind of my interpretation of it would be like having a pity party. Like, you know, good Lord, my summer's ruined. I already lost my whole school year, yada, yada, yada. Just... And, and then came to her senses and realized, you know what, what right do I have to be upset about this, whatever, there's people that don't even have arms, and whatever, so just going through. but note it, and, and then says that was just healed, like gone, like it's just gone, like she's fine, and says that, that there's no other explanation for it, just I was healed. So, now you think about that. We would celebrate that. You know, oh my gosh, your arm's not hurt anymore. Your hand's not hurt anymore. I didn't celebrate that. I celebrated the fact that in the midst of a trial, you came to your senses and took God's side over against your flesh's side. Like, that was the precursor to it. Now, that, that's not saying that you healed yourself. That's just saying it's amazing that the humility preceded the healing. That only when you are humble before the Lord, when you fret not yourself, because it tends only to evil, when you stop the fretting, it's amazing how open you are to other things. And that, that would be why then there are some churches that would say, well, if you have humility, it's like a formula. So now get humble enough and God will heal you. It's like a mantra. It's like a genie in a bottle. Like that's rubbing the lamp. If you just get humble and pray, and you know, then God will heal you. Well, he doesn't always. But that also is proof of the fact that we have to be humble at peace in the midst of warring circumstances, in the midst of a cursed world, internally we are blessed. Our hearts, our spirits, our minds are blessed even in the midst of a cursed world. Right? Even where we are feeling the experiences of the curse in our hand, in our arm, in our bodies, in our circumstances. Right? I mean, we all have those things that are on a scale from minor annoyances to just cataclysmic, life-altering events. I mean, we all have those. That's just part of living in a cursed world. The question is, what is our internal response to that? How do we respond to that? Well, the 37th Psalm shows a picture of someone at peace with that, at rest. So we will pick up where we left off. Verse 16, better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. And I would say, when I read that, I'm going to say, well, why? That doesn't seem right. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. In other words, you're better off having nothing with God than everything without Him. Because without God, you are cursed. With God, you are not. So, better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. 
for the arms of the wicked shall be broken. That, that's the reason. The reason that you don't want to be prosperous as wicked is because the Lord will not uphold you. He upholds the righteous. He punishes the wicked. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. Of course, we realize those who are blameless in Christ, covered, their heritage will remain forever. They have heaven waiting on them, an inheritance promised to them, not put to shame in evil times. Though it looks like they are, right? I mean, it looks like they're put to shame. It looks like they're banking all their hopes on a folly. And yet, they will be proven, they will be vindicated in the end. But the wicked will perish, verse 20. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish, like smoke they vanish away. They're like the glories of the pasture. The pasture is green for a while and then it turns brown. And he's saying that's what the wicked are like. That's what the enemies of the Lord are like. They're like the glory of the pasture. They vanish, vanish away, gone. One minute they look green, the next minute they're gone. The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. Notice this. Once again, the, what we're talking about here is how can, not, how can I be right with God? Well, be generous and give. No, it's what is the picture of someone who is right with God? They're generous and they give. Now you might say, okay, now I've got to go home and decide if I'm generous enough. Am I generous enough to prove that I am right with God? No, you're not supposed to be measuring. You don't measure your generosity. When you are generous, in fact, Jesus uses that specific instance to say don't measure. Pharisees, they like to hear the ringing of the coin in the offering plate. You, when you give, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. You, you don't keep track. You just, just give and don't even worry about it. Don't measure it. Don't think about it. It's just done. Right? You're just generous because that's what Christians are. They're generous. But notice this. The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. Because the righteous is generous and gives because those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land. In other words, what is the motivation for the generosity? The inheritance. Those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. In other words, why are the wicked takers and, and looking out for number one because they are going to be cut off. They are cursed. Why are the righteous generous and givers? Because they are blessed by God, inheritors of the land. In other words, when you know that you are an inheritor of heaven, you have nothing to fight for on earth. What is there to fight for on earth when you are inheriting heaven? The, the, there's nothing good about earth compared to heaven. And you are getting that given to you. You're getting that thrown in for free. What would you have to war for here? What does any of this matter, in other words? The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. So in other words, when God delights in your way, he establishes your steps. And though you stumble, though you fall, you shall not be cast headlong. In other words, it won't ultimately hurt you because the Lord upholds you. This is, what good news is this? Like, does God demand require perfection? Yes. Are you perfect? Yes, in one sense. Are you perfect? No, in another sense. And all of that imperfection in this other sense cannot cause you to be cast headlong. It, you, it, it is not catastrophic. None of your stumblings, none of your fallings, none of your failings are catastrophic. None of them. 
None of them ultimately can hurt you. That's just incredible. No, no failing of yours can hurt you. I mean, we often think about the world and how it's against us or how circumstances aren't going our way. The greatest problem for you is not the world. The greatest problem for you is yourself. The greatest problem for you is that you are a sinner and have to be granted righteousness. What a beautiful thing that at that righteousness being given to you, at that point, from then on, your sin cannot hurt you. If you've been granted righteousness, how can your sin hurt you? Think about it. Think about a judge. Think about court. I dare you to try to go to jail after the judge drops the gavel with a not guilty verdict. Try to get in jail. I mean, no, I demand that the bailiff put me in cuffs. I demand that you haul me off to jail. I demand it. It's only right. No, you've been declared not guilty. But I want three squares in a bed. Right? I mean, try to go to jail after you've been not convicted. We as Christians spend a lot of time trying to cover sins that have already been covered. When there's no, no good that can come from that. That only lends to evil. I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Now, this is a reminder that even though this psalm is first and foremost about Jesus, it isn't written by Jesus. It was written by David, and David, when he wrote this psalm, his psalm is professing that he is old. He is writing this one as an older man. Now, I think it's interesting because he says, he is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Clearly, this is not just about David. This has to be about something greater than David because David's children, eh, it's debatable whether they became a blessing. Right? I mean, some of them did, some of them did, clearly did not. So, As an old man, he looks around and he says, I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. That is an internal attitude. Right? That's an internal attitude because will children of the Lord suffer? Absolutely. Will they go through times of lack and hunger? Absolutely. Will his children run around begging for bread? No, and here's why. Here's the picture, right, of the Christian. The picture of the Christian is one who is content in all circumstances. I have learned to be content with plenty and with lack. I've learned to be content with that. Whatever my, whatever my earthly circumstance, Paul says, he's learned contentment. And so he has... With lack, no worries, no fretting, no begging as though, oh, life is terrible, life is over. No, never seen the children of God as beggars. Why? Because you're more than conquerors through him who loves you. You're not a beggar. You're an inheritor of heaven. And that, that attitude overtakes you. It's almost as though you're a victim of it. Right? I mean, you know, you have some earthly circumstance, like an arm or a hand or something that's bothering you, and finally you're just at your wit's end about it, and then in the middle of that, a whole other thought, an alien thought comes in, a foreign thought comes in to you from outside of you that says, not what's wrong with the world, it sucks, but what's wrong with you that you're so ungrateful with your sore hand? Like, well, if anybody has a right to feel like they're ungrateful for at least a minute, it seems like it would be me with my sore hand. I mean, these people aren't dealing with sore hand. I'm the one dealing with sore hand. So I feel like I'm a little bit justified, at least a little. And no, the word, it's amazing that the word of 
you want to say condemnation, but it's not really that. But the word of conviction comes to you and actually in the midst of your suffering convicts you that you are wrong for worrying about your suffering. And in, when that happens, you are in good hands because you are following in the footsteps of Jesus. You are following in the footsteps of Job. Right? That in the midst of your suffering, the rightful response is humility, not pride, not sorrow, not self-pity. Humility. Never seen as children begging for bread. Why? Because... Their hearts are purified. They're cleansed. As they go through these circumstances, these experiences that are trying, God gives them strength. He gives them a whole new, renewed strength that they never even experienced before. Verse 27, Turn away from evil and do good. So shall you dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. So this is the picture of a Christian. Turning away from evil, doing good. That's, that's not, that doesn't fly in the face of anything that I have preached over the last years. Nothing. I, I have always said that that is a, a necessary thing to see. I'm just saying none of us are qualified to be the seer. I mean, in other words, I don't, I don't negate the, I, the notion that there is an image of a Christian, that, that he, he would have, that he would look a certain way in the world, and he would act a certain way, and he would feel a certain way, and all of that. I'm just saying not one of us has ever measured up to it. And that's okay. But it doesn't mean that when you look in the mirror, you shouldn't see some of that, or long to see it, or wish you could see it, or look forward to the day when you will see it. That's more where I am, because I've given up on trying to see it. I, mean, uh, I, I just look forward to the day when I can be perfect in heaven, because I know that day will never come here. But notice that this... Jesus is the one who did this. Turn away from evil and do good. That was Jesus. So shall you dwell forever. That's law. And Jesus kept it. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. That's Jesus. They are preserved forever. But the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land. Those who are in Christ shall inherit the land because Christ himself earned the land. He earned it. He bought it. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. Once again, who, who does that look like? Jesus. Now David clearly can also say this about himself. He can say this about himself and his experiences with Saul. But... We know that Jesus claims this psalm for himself as he claims them all. The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. The Lord will not abandon him to his power or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. <clears throat> I mean, think about Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate's like, don't you know I have authority over you? And what does Jesus say? You have no authority over me that's not been given by my Father. The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. The Lord will not abandon him to his power or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. Jesus walks into the court of Pontius Pilate and of King Herod and knows full well, I'm fine. Everything is working out according to plan. Can you picture that? Everything is working out according to plan. And you think about the fact that he says... That we read earlier, the wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. And you think about what Jesus experienced at his trial and you realize these people had their swords drawn, their bows drawn back, arrows pointed at Jesus and Jesus is in that room knowing full well, 
all of that is going to turn on them. That, in fact, their mission is suicidal. They think that they are going to bring down Jesus. And Jesus knows that by them trying to bring down Jesus, they're bringing down themselves. What a, I mean, man and I were talking the other day, like, we, we know a family, and I'm not going to mention names, but it's like, they're, they're a little bit intimidating because they're very, very smart, all of them, and they all act like they know something that you don't know. Like, you're not in on something. Like, like they, they're they just, like, when you talk to them, you're like, you feel inferior because you feel like you're being left out of something. Like, they all know something, a, a secret to how the world works or whatever that you don't know. And, like, just interesting. You know, we, we were playfully talking about it. But that was Jesus before Pontius Pilate. I mean, he knew something that they didn't know. He knew there was no reason to fret. It would tend only to evil. What would fretting for Jesus do on that night? What if he would have fretted? Can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine if after the Garden of Gethsemane, when he sweat blood and was strengthened by angels, if he got up and said, you know what, the angels aren't enough. I mean, instead of healing the soldier's ear when Peter cut it off? What if he finished the job and cut off the soldier's head with his finger? Like, what, what if he did with his eyes like Superman? Like, what if he would have just decided, you know what? Forget this. I'm not doing this. You people are not worth it. What if he would have just decided that? And in doing so, would have Followed in the footsteps, not of his heavenly father, but of his earthly father, Adam. What, what if he would have done that? What if Jesus would have done that? What if Jesus would have not fulfilled his father's will? He says, my father loves me because I always do what pleases him. Adam didn't. What if Jesus would have followed in the footsteps of Adam? And decided, you know what? I'm not doing it. You know what? It's not enough. Thanks for the angels, Dad, but this is not enough. I, when we decided this, I mean, this was before then. I mean, you know, like, we need to sell your car, son, and you need to ride a bike to work because the car's too expensive. Okay, I can handle that. And like a week in, riding the bike, you're like, this is stupid. I, I can't believe I let you talk me into selling my car. You know, it, I, I didn't sign up for this. You made it sound like it was going to be easy. I mean, what if Jesus would have been that way? You know, when we discussed this whole dying on the cross and taking all your wrath thing, I didn't realize what that meant, you know. I mean, I've been doing that now for 30 years, and we haven't even got to the serious part yet, and I'm just tired. I'm just wore out of this. I didn't deserve this. What did I do to deserve this? Nothing. And so I'm not doing it. What if Jesus would have done that? What if he would have fretted what was coming, what was what he was going through, and repeat, or revolted against his father's will? Well, it tends only to evil. Fretting. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Jesus didn't do that. Because Jesus knew things like Psalm 37. Wait for the Lord, verse 34. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. And he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That's what the Bible says about Jesus, wait for the Lord and keep his way. So he didn't fret. He didn't make his own way. He waited for the Lord's plan to be fulfilled for him. Well, what is the Lord's plan for you to be fulfilled for you? To just hold on to the gospel. That's it. That's his will for you. What must we be doing to be doing the works of the Lord? And what does Jesus answer? Believe in the one whom he has sent. That's the answer. That's, that's God's will for you. For Jesus, keeping his way was going to the cross. For you, keeping his way is taking up the cross of belief. Because that's impossible on its own. And so, it's, it's, there is no other. There's nothing else. Now you might say, or if you're a thinker, then you might be thinking, but I thought that there was this perfect image of what a Christian should look like. And so if there's nothing else other than belief, but you've also already laid out that there's some other things. Got a treat for you in a minute. 
Verse 35, I have seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree. But he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I saw him, he could not be found. See the wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree. Isn't it interesting that the wicked in the world seem to be prospering? They seem to be prospering. They seem, they seem to be green trees. They seem to just keep spreading out their dominion. They seem to just keep spreading out their prosperity. And it's pretty, and it's beautiful, and it looks orderly. It looks, it looks right. I mean, well, this is just the way the world works, and they're good at it. They're good at doing, they're good at getting their way. And they know how to use the world, and they appear to be prospering. But he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I saw him, he could not be found. Seemed to be really doing well, and then, boom, passed away. Gone. Gone. And then what? See this just so often, over and over again in the world. But this world is not permanent. It's not permanent. It's, it's so not permanent that if not for Christ, it would be scary. And it is, isn't it? I mean, why do you think you've got to have a helmet to ride a bike now? I mean, well, gosh, I mean, I could get a concussion. I could die. I mean, I could hit my head and die. I mean, I just read this little article thing last night, or this little post, and it said the, the, their little kid was stuck in a washing machine, got stuck in a washing machine, like a three-year-old. They got a brand new washing machine. It was a front one, and it started loading, like... And then she had like a four-year-old brother or whatever, and it was like the middle of the night. And the four-year-old brother came and woke up, and mom and dad was crying. And saw him, was hysterical, and couldn't say anything, couldn't hardly get the words out. And they're like, what is he trying to say? And then finally, the dad went running downstairs, and he said, she said, or he said, whatever the girl's name is, something, something, washing machine or something. And so, like, went down there and managed to get her out. Like, it wasn't full yet, but the kid, and it was interesting, though. What was interesting is because the mom said, you know, it is amazing to me that my kids just continually look for ways to die. Like, like it just, you wouldn't think. I mean, we do all the things right. We do everything. You know, you got the perfect car seat. You got all the things. You keep them corralled. You do everything. You get a washing machine, and you would never think that they could figure out while you're in bed, hey, why don't we go down and lock you in the washing machine and start it? Like, you would never think that, but it's so true. Like, kids are always trying to kill themselves. Like, they're always looking for ways to hurt themselves. Like, you got to watch them, like, boy, I just can't take my eyes off you. You're always doing something, right? It would be a scary world, and it is. That's why <clears throat> nanny, that's why big brother in nanny state has to tell you everything you can do. Don't eat, don't eat that egg. Don't drink that milk. Don't drive this speed limit. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I mean, we got, you're an idiot. You're a suicidal idiot. We've got to keep you and protect you from yourself because you will kill yourself. We have to. We will be the only ones who can kill you. Thank you. <laughs> if you don't let us protect you, we will kill you. You will. We will let us protect you, and you will like it because we are smarter than you, and we know what we're doing. That's the kind of world you would get without Christ. I mean, that's the world that you get. We spend a lot of time trying to build something in this world when there is nothing in this world. Like, anything you build in this world is nothing. Nothing. Like, there's no value to it whatsoever. There's nothing. No significance. It's chaff. It's so interesting that we have to realize how Americanized our Christianity is. How it is a mirror of our culture at large. And it's not that way if you would go overseas. If you go over to Pakistan or Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia or Egypt, as a Christian... You are not putting eternal weight on anything in this world because you probably won't be here tomorrow. You're just trying to eat, live another day, 
protect your kids the best you can and wait for them to kill you because you're a Christian or persecute you or for life to go bad. You're not worrying about getting that promotion at work. You can't find work because you're a Christian and you're marked. You know, we're always, all these movies and stuff, you're waiting for a mark on your hand and your forehead and, oh, you've got to have the mark. And if you don't have the mark, then you won't be able to eat and you won't be able to buy stuff in the marketplace and all that. Beloved, that's happening right now. It's just not happening in this Disney world called America. But it's happening all over the world. If you are a Christian in many countries, you're not getting the cushy job. You're lucky you get a job at all. Nobody's going to hire you. Muslims don't hire Christians. They enslave them. You, you're not getting the job. You're not building anything. And so, how, how hard is it then to base your life on the American standard of hard work and stability and building and you, you can't even do that. It's not even an open door for you. That's not even a possibility. The, in other words, the only reason that Christians in this culture expect that of themselves and others, some kind of an upward mobility and a progression and just do this and that and that and that and stack everything up and be responsible and all that. There is no responsible in Saudi Arabia for a Christian. You're just surviving. So is he, is he sinning? Is he sinning because he isn't able to get a good job? Well, don't give me that. Everybody's got excuses for why they can't get a good job. The only reason you would talk that way is because you're in this Disney world called America. But without this country, you would not even have that context to think that. You, you know what I mean? Like, it's like when the Apostle Paul was on his missionary journeys and he came across a group of Christians. And he said... Have you guys been filled with the Spirit? And what did they say? We didn't even know there was a Spirit. And he says, well, then who? Uh, were you baptized? Yeah, we were baptized, like, you know, John the Baptist, baptism. And Paul's like, oh, no, no, that's yesterday's baptism. No, you, you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then you'll be filled with the Spirit. Oh, we didn't even know there was a Spirit. Okay, well, let's do that then. And he did. He baptized them in the name of Jesus, and they were filled with the Spirit. And they started speaking in tongues and having all sorts of to fruits that, or gifts of the Spirit, whatever, to, to signify that the Spirit had fallen on them, that, that the gospel had progressed to this new group of people. Right? And so, context is everything. These guys were going through their Christian life spiritless, because they didn't even know there was a Spirit. And then all of a sudden, they did know there was a spirit. And that changed everything. Well, we are going through our lives in a context with a certain set of knowledge. We understand what it is to live in America, to have Western values, to be capitalist, all, all of those things. We understand all those things. To be individuals, we understand all those things. And you can't think that that doesn't influence the way you see things and the way you prioritize and all of that. But if any of it was taken away, you wouldn't think that way. In other words, Christians that are born and raised and die in Pakistan do not think like Americans. And so they don't think like American Christians either. Does that make sense? Like, it's just totally different. And so, so much of what I see as American Christianity is this. I have seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself out like a green laurel tree. Like, that's what, I, I see Christians in America striving to be that. Oh, wouldn't it be nice to be like a green laurel tree, spread out, healthy, vibrant, green, living the abundant life, living your best life now, living, living good. We are called to be so much more than what we currently are. I mean, this, it's, I mean, there is a way that you can take that song, Thrive, and I first heard it and was like, eh, I don't know. And then I thought about it a different way. I was like, I understand what they're saying. And there is a way that you can definitely take that in a gospel-centered way. But there's also a way as an American Christian that you can take that in an entirely American way and be like, no, you're meant to have a thousand-member church with a nice paid parking lot with painted yellow lines and greeters at the door and 
a million dollar budget and all of your kids are perfect honor roll students and they're all going to Harvard because after all, I mean, they're Christians. I mean, you've got to be a light to the world. You're not a loser like some inner city kid. I mean, we've given you every advantage because we're Christians and we work, we have a work ethic and we know a man doesn't work, neither should he eat and all that. And we just, I mean, we have it all together here. And who should have it more all together than a Christian after all? That's, that's the American idea of Christianity. And I deliberately do everything I can to not be that. I mean, I wear my farm sandals to preach it. Because my shoes are in a car that my son has. But, uh, but I have no problem pointing it out. I'm not ashamed of them. Right? I have no desire to be like the green laurel tree. You know why? Because he passed away. I have no idea if I will, I mean, literally, literally could have been my last word. But it wasn't. Thank you, Lord, I suppose. I mean, I'd be with you would be better, but evidently you still have the sermon you want me to finish. Finish could have been my last word, but it wasn't. Nope. No, nope. could have been my last word. But it's not. And some of you, if it was, you would wonder if I said not or snot. You would be like, was his last word not or snot? What's my point? We all die. And none of us pick the time. And so everything you think you're building is nothing. It's nothing. What is it? What, what is it, actually? Nothing, because you're going to die. So you might say, but it's something because my kids will get it. What if they die? They're going to die too. Here's the news. They're going to die too. Eventually, everybody's going to die. And everything you think is something is nothing if there's no one there to know that it's something. Does that make sense? So the point of all of this is there's nothing here. Heaven is where there's something. Heaven is what we're longing for. So you might think, well, then what are we doing here? We're building castles in the sand. That's what we're doing here. It's all nothing. It's just, it's just something to take up the time. We're just taking up time. Now, you're pretty much free, at least in this culture, to take up your time with all kinds of things. So you can take up your time with anything you want, pretty much. But make no mistake, you're not building anything. You're just taking up time. And if all you're doing is taking up time, there's no reason to fret over it. You only fret when you think you're building something because you think that you have something of value to lose. That's when you fret. You fret when you think you can lose something. If you don't think you can lose something. When you first get to King's Island and you're running and you're all happy and everything and you're riding rides and all that, you're, you're, you're on cloud nine for a minute, especially if it's your first time. Everything's new and you're like, oh my gosh. You don't start fretting until about, oh, 8 o'clock at night. That's when you start fretting. Why do you start fretting? Nobody. Nobody's been through this. I've been through this. I've been through this when I was 30. Because it's going to close soon. I start fretting at 8 o'clock because I realize, well, darn, in three hours, the park's going to be closed. I'll only, and gosh, the lines are two hours long, so I probably got maybe one more ride or something. Now I start fretting. Now I have to start calculating. Well, if I go ride the Beast, that's probably like a two-hour line all the time, even though it's like the oldest, crustiest ride in the place. It's still not the two-hour line because it's the only good ride left there anyway, even after all these new ones. So you can go to the Beast and look at all you guys. You're fretting. You're fretting right now, and it's tending to evil. No. <laughs> But, right, but you're, now you've got to start calculating. Now you have to start planning and assessing and thinking. Instead of just enjoying, like you've been doing all day, running around for ride and ride with reckless abandon and just, oh, it's great. Now you have to start planning. Oh my, time's getting short. I have to decide, is it more important for me to ride Diamondback or Beast or whatever that one big pukey ride that you can ride, Delirium or whatever. I mean, you, you, or should we just go and find something to eat? What, what should we do? You know, older people, they're like, we've ridden enough rides. Let's go find something to eat. The kids are like, no, i got two more rides. If I'm really smart with my time here, I can really make this work. I can fit it in. When you know time is short and you feel like something is to be lost, 
then you start planning, fretting, plotting, manipulating, manipulating your parents. Well, but we'll meet you back at the front. We'll meet you here. Can we meet you here? We want to go separate ways because he wants to ride beast and I want to ride diamondback. And that's not fair if you want to make me ride diamondback. I want to ride beast. And so you start manipulating and I'll hate you forever if you don't let us separate. I mean, you'll do whatever you can because you feel like there's something to lose. That's Christians every single day in our culture. Running around, fretting, not loving, not generous, not at rest, not at peace, not joyful, not patient, because they feel like something eternally significant is happening every second of every day. And you have to, quote, redeem the time. Here's news for you. Time's already been redeemed. Time has been so well redeemed, you are free to play. <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? Time has been so redeemed, you're in a playground now. That's how little work there is left for you to do. You just play. Now you're playing, you might play by working. You might play by playing. You might play by sleeping. Here's what I am sure of. There is somebody that is addicted to sleep. I mean, Professing Christian, just addicted to sleep. I can promise you right now, we will walk the streets of heaven together. The one who spent their life sleeping and the one who spent their life playing. and We will walk the streets together with the one who spent their life working. Because at the end of the day, all of it is just redeemed sandcastle playground time. We don't fret over it. We don't fret. What, what is there to fret over? Me. Well, but uh, I might not get this. Well, then you don't get that. Well, but this hurts. Well, then that hurts. But what? What is there to fret over? Mark the blameless and behold the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. But transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. That's just... That's why you don't fret. Because the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. It's a gift. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. He's their stronghold. The Lord. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Beloved, we are those who have taken refuge in God. Through Christ. Christ is our righteousness. He is our redeemer. He is the righteous one for us so that our righteousness is not counted. Our wickedness is not counted. Only his righteousness. That's it. Salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is our stronghold. He is our deliverer because we take refuge in him. But that, what a beautiful picture that is. What just a beautiful picture. How, how at rest, how at peace could you be if you actually believe that? I mean, I don't mean you don't, but I just mean all of us. Like, how beautiful would it be for us to believe that? To, to truly believe that it's all good. It's all good. There's nothing bad. Like even the things you think are bad, eh, they're not that bad. Nothing can keep you from your inheritance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel, for the gospel that declares us righteous, that makes it so, for the gospel that gives us peace, that we are free to follow in the footsteps of the man of peace. The one who, when given every freedom and opportunity to, like Adam, betray you, chose instead to follow your path and earn for himself the spot of righteousness. Lord, we pray that you would help us to rest in Jesus. That you would help us to relax in Jesus. That we would cease our striving. That we would 
put our hope and all of our faith in you. Lord, we thank you that there is a picture, a model of perfection. We thank you that it is Jesus and not us. But Lord, we also trust you when you say, if we behold you, we will become like you. I pray that you would help us to behold you more and more and more. That you would become more and more precious and beautiful to us with each passing breath. In Jesus' name, amen. Love